What's going on guys? Today I've been thinking. First of all, shout out to all of my nerdy, intellectual black folks who are leaving these well-constructed comments in the comments section. I really appreciate you. I appreciate the intriguing conversation that you guys are having in the comments section. It just, every day I wake up and I just read and I read every comment and I go through it and I'm just sitting there like, yes, this is my tribe, this is my folks. In today's video, the village is broken. I've been doing a lot of content and I've been really, really thinking. Like Atlanta in the 80s is a, was a different place than it is today. The other day I went to the beautiful restaurant. The food is still slamming, but I noticed that the neighborhood has changed dramatically. It is, interestingly enough, a lot of white people now live off the West End and Cascade area, a lot. And one of the things that I remember coming to Atlanta, and I want to even take a few steps back further, is growing up. And this is reminiscent of the car rental business. A lot of people struggled to get a ride or have someone, you know, if they didn't have money for an Uber or Lyft. And I remember literally if I needed a ride, now first of all, I wouldn't ask someone for a ride somewhere unless it was important. I wouldn't just be like, hey, could you take me? I, I wouldn't do that. I would walk first. So if I actually needed a ride, I needed help, it was just going to a neighbor. It was that easy. It wasn't hard. And the village, and the, the, the video that I put up before this one talking about the clinically depressed, we have people who are clinically depressed because we no longer have a village. The village is broken. Because every time I talk about it, I get a lot of pushback about getting married, getting a wife, and having a family. And notice when on my Disruptive Male channel, I never speak out against those concepts like many male channels do, like you shouldn't cohabitate, you shouldn't get married, you shouldn't have kids, and all that is based in fear. And what I think is a high degree of antisocial behavior. Years and years ago, I used to work in Northside Hospital and I worked in the nursery. And I noticed that babies crave human contact. And if you have a baby that isn't appropriately loved and cared for, this is the breeding ground for social paths. This is the breeding ground for social paths. Having a baby that grows up that no one cares, no one loves, no one hugs, no one has shows this baby affection. That is the breeding ground for social paths, which is why I feel that we're in a very strange place. Cause I was watching a video the other day talking about one of these boss chicks and she was just talking about how unhappy she was. And this is one of the reasons that I talk about building a business. Oh yeah, someone left a comment like, all right, once again, to my people who leave the well-constructed comments, I really appreciate you. But if I talk about, I fucked harder chicks than you, I got more money than you, that's my life. And if that makes you feel some kind of way, you need to stop watching because you're just a jealous ass little bitch. That's all it is to it. Once again, the tribe, you get it, you understand why I do the things. But if you're tired of hearing me doing better than you, oh, you're just tired of it. And also, this channel is about the, econ the economy. This isn't the business channel. The business channel is Hustlers Kung Fu. So I'm pretty transparent with my moves. You know, uh, like it's pretty easy to find out, figure out what I'm doing. So I feel that that person just wanted to vent because he feels less than. So going back to what I was going to talk about, this is why I talk about creating a business that makes you happy. If you're creating a business, if you're serving customers that you actually like, you're doing work that you actually like, you're building a business that fulfills you, 
when you get the money, you're not going to be unhappy. Let me say this again. If you build your business based upon your proclivities, habits, talents, things you like to do, when you get the money, you're not going to be unhappy. Because every time I he see this, it's like, man, I got all this money. I'm clinically depressed. You've built a business that you really don't give a damn about. You built a business that produces all this revenue and this income, and it doesn't make you happy. I've been doing YouTube for 12 years. There's no way I could keep doing this if I didn't like it, if I didn't enjoy it, if I didn't get some pleasure out of it. I couldn't keep doing this. And this is one of the things, this is another reason that the village is broken. This expression that I hate, securing the bag. I hate that expression. I don't use it only, I only use it when I wanna talk bad about it. Securing the bag, everyone's securing the bag, chasing the bag, or maybe they're fumbling the bag. This is trunicated talk for wealth building. A bag, you shouldn't have, quote, a bag. You should have a revenue stream. A bag denotes that it's a set sum of money. You should have a revenue stream. This is one of the things I teach. You shouldn't be trying to secure the bag. You should be trying to secure a revenue stream. You should be trying to secure consistent monthly income and revenue. That's what you should be chasing. That's what you should be working on. That's what you should be building. And the village is broken because I remember as a child, we would go visit people once again. Now this is something like there was this comedian and he's an Italian guy and it's here on YouTube and I can't remember it, but he was talking about, you know, how your mother would have preparations for guests. Like right here, all this liquor I have is for guests. It ain't for me. When someone comes over, you want a drink? I'm a host. I have all of this stuff for guests. I got food in the refrigerator for guests. I got apples and bananas. I got all this stuff for guests. Someone comes by, someone drops by. You want a drink? You want this? You want this? I have these things on hand just in case. And the comedian was talking about your, your mother would have these little tea cakes that you couldn't touch. You couldn't eat them because they were for guests. And having guests was something that was held in high esteem. To have someone come visit you, someone to come spend a little time with you, someone to come. And the comedian was talking about, you know, the difference between back then when people prepared to have guests at a moment's notice. When I was a kid, there was this thing called I was just in the neighborhood and I just decided to drop by. When I came home from the military, I would just go to people's houses unannounced. I didn't even think that I had to call them. I would just drive up to their house, knock on the door. Hey, what's up? I'm back on time. I'm in town from leave. I thought I'd come by. Come on in. Come on in. I didn't have to call these folks. I just showed up. I just dropped by. And he was talking about, you know, I was in the neighborhood and I just decided to drop by unannounced just to bring some joy into your life. Now, if someone drops by and you don't know they're coming, you may call the police. I mean, the, the village is broken. That when human connection and once again, I'm about to really talk bad about MGTO and Red Pill. These two collectives are, are full of antisocial behavior. If you're adopting Red Pill ways, if you're adopting MGTO ways, you're on the pathway to becoming a social psych psychopath. That behavior isn't inherently normal. It's not normal to be alone. There are some people who are wired differently, like Timothy Ward, She on the Loose, The Upgrade. These people, like, they don't need anyone. They can live on their own and be perfectly happy. 
But most of us are wired for human companionship, uh, human relations. And, you know, I've had people talk smack because when I actually put on there and I'm not mentioning any names, but this bitch lonely as hell. I can tell by her YouTube content. She is lonely as hell. She never talks about being in a relationship. She never talks about having anybody. She's in her mid thirties. If you know anything about a woman in her mid thirties having children, that's considered a high risk pregnancy. And I don't think she's ever going to get married. I don't think that she's ever going to have uh, a relationship. I don't think it's going to happen because she is kind of one of those boss chicks. And I see a lot of loneliness because once again, the village is broken. The village is broken. The village is um, not doing well because essentially you have men and women. You have men and women who are not living according to the grand design. They're not living according to the grand plan. They're not living according to God's will. And those, you know, people ask me, do I believe in a higher power? Yes, I believe in God, but my relationship with God is totally different than your relationship with God. I feel that God gave me everything that I needed to be healthy, happy, and successful in life, but it's incumbent upon me to do the work to develop that life. When I was born, God's like, there's your talent, there's your attributes, there's your personality, there's your ability. Go forth and be successful. That's my relationship with God. I don't feel like I don't pray and I don't do any of that stuff. I don't feel that um, I need to be all up in the house of the Lord to be blessed by God. I feel that when I was born in 1966, I was blessed by God because he gave me life. That's a blessing. And many people out here are clinically depressed, sad, despondent, because they don't appreciate the blessing of being born. Do you understand how many things have to go right for your mom and dad to have sex and for you to be conceived? I'm going to tell you a story. Lay Paris, you're going to love this. There was a woman who was 38. And this woman wasn't on birth control. And I used to squirt up in her all day long because I knew statistically the chances of her getting pregnant were actually quite low. They were actually quite low. Now, if she was 25 and not on birth control. Oh, hell to the no would I've done that. But because she was 38 and I remember, you know, you know, one morning she said, hey, my cycle's late. I think I might be pregnant. And I was like, <laughs> you're not pregnant. And she said, you, you said that because you hope. I said, no, you're not pregnant. Your cycle's going to come. And she's like, you seem to be pretty sure. It's like, yeah. Week later, cycle came. And she's like, how did you know? And then I went ahead and it's like, um, I'm not trying to be harmful because I think you're a beautiful woman. I think you're amazing. The sex is awesome. But the older a woman gets, the harder it, get, it becomes for her to have children. It's just very, very hard. And she was 38, almost 39. And I knew that I can squirt up in there with reckless abandon. Just, oh, yeah, yeah. you get some cum. You get some cum. You get because she had never had children. Now, I wouldn't have did that if she had already had children. If you know, if a woman had two or three children when she was younger, her ability to conceive remains quite fertile until damn near 50. She could be 
50 and she can have a baby because she's already, her system has already been pumped up. Her system has already been juiced up. So, um, this is, this is, this is knowledge. I've never had a pregnancy scare. I had a pregnancy with someone who intentionally got pregnant. She did not, it wasn't an accident. She intentionally got pregnant. So one of the things that I, and th this is another reason that the village is broken. You have women out here who are like, I don't want to have children because they want to get away from their biological imperative. This is, a, you have men who don't want to get married. You have women who don't want to have children. You have men who don't want to be head of household. They don't want to be the leaders. They, it, it comes back down to responsibility. Without a bunch of responsible people, our society will crumble. And that's where we are because we've got a group of people. Incidentally, it's the wealthy people who are still getting married and having children. It's kind of a social status symbol to have four or five kids to show that you have enough money to have that many kids and raise them. That's what's turned. And Mexicans are having a lot of children. White people as a whole, they're dying out. Black folks, the uh, teenage birth rate has dropped quite a bit, but we're still popping out babies, still popping out babies. And here's the thing with the broken village that anytime anyone comes here on social media and talks about the things that you need to do to fix the village, people don't want to do it because it's rooted in selfishness. They don't want to get married. And like I said, when I started the first version of Disruptive Mail, I talked about if you want to get married, I'll help you. If you want to have a girlfriend, I'll help you because that's normal behavior. It is normal behavior. That's why when you see this fine woman with her titties all out and your dick gets hard, that's normal. That's your biological imperative. That's normal. And you see a lot of antisocial behavior. I have a friend who got a vasectomy when he was 27 because he didn't want to have no kids. He didn't want to have no kids. And uh, it was very interesting because someone he was dealing with she came up pregnant and he called me. He said, guess who's pregnant? I was like, no one you're dealing with. You had a vasectomy. He said, I saw the blue. I saw the little test strip. She's pregnant. So what this means is she was cheating on him and they were in a committed, supposedly monogamous relationship. And my dude, he, he, he went with it. He was like, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. And he went to the doctor's visits with her. And the whole time, he knew that baby wasn't his. He knew that baby wasn't his. And he went to the doctor's visits with her. And he actually was in the hospital. And he was there when the child was born. And then when it came for him to sign the birth certificate, he wrote in Donald Duck on the birth certificate. <laughs> and then he announced to her family who was there, uh, I think there's something that all of y'all should know that this isn't my child. This lying bitch was cheating on me. And that's, that's the exact verbiage he used. And everyone was shocked and they was like, what, what, what? And he said, we're going to do a DNA test. And they did the DNA test and the child wasn't his. So she was embarrassed in front of her friends, her family and everyone. Cause it was like, Oh, they ain't his kid. You told him it was his kid, but it wasn't his kid. Now, this is what's very really interesting. Later on, after all this was over, because he knew he wasn't on the hook, he said, I want that. I was like, what do you want? He said, I knew I was just playing a game, but I want to meet a woman. I want to have a baby. I was like, what? You? You want to have a baby? You? He said, like, yeah. So what he did is he got in a, another relationship with a committed woman and he had his vasectomy reversed. And he didn't tell her that he had his vasectomy reversed. He didn't tell her. And he was skeet, skeet, skeet. And then 
One morning, she gets up and she's sick and she goes up and she throws up in the bathroom. And then for the next few weeks, all of the symptoms of pregnancy, her breast got huge. She already had big titties, they got bigger. And then, you know, she's like, what is going on with me? And the whole time he knew she was pregnant and he didn't tell her. And he says, maybe you should have a pregnancy test. And then she's like, but you had a vasectomy. I have not been sleeping with no one with you. He's like, take the pregnancy test. So she takes the pregnancy test and she's like shocked. She's like, how is this possible? And then he got down on one hand and knee and presented his pregnant girlfriend with an engagement ring and says, I want to marry you. I want to be with you. I want to have children with you. I had my vasectomy reversed because I knew that you were the woman I wanted to have my children. And the woman collapsed on her knees. She started crying and she said, yes, 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 yes. And they got married and now they have three kids. See, once you start to get into your biological imperative, because you know, I got people like, Glenda, man, you too old to have kids and all this other stuff. Um, I forget the movie star's name, but her father was 60 years old when she was born. See, children make the world better. Is it an ordeal raising children? Yeah, you gotta be a parent, you gotta work, you gotta teach them manners. There's a lot, there's a lot that you have to do. There's a lot that you have to do. And um, one of the things that you have to understand is that when you claim, like once again, I got rid of my house because that house was a barrier because I had the house decorated the way that I wanted it. And I'll, I'll talk about that. And one of the things that came with me selling that house was I started getting rid of stuff. So when I meet that woman and I get down on that knee and I propose, we're going to buy furniture together. We're going to buy a house together. We're going to buy stuff together. It's going to be a joint decision because one of the things that I realized is that house was my house. It wasn't our house. It was my house. I, I did have quite a few chicks try to move in. Hobosexual central hobosexuals. Hobosexuals were trying to move in. But one of the things that's going to happen as I go forward is I've created room in my life to have someone. I've created room in my life to develop a relationship. I've created room in my life because I'm a child of the 60s. I know how to do this stuff. I know how to visit. You know, I have friends that I send texts like, how you doing, man? Just out the blue. What's going on? How you living? How you doing? And one of the things with the broken village, because we have social media, which is giving people a facade of how life should be. A, a facade. Like, I am 55 years old and I feel that I'm going to get married and have more children. Because once again, I'm going to marry a younger woman. And Bill Ackerman, who's a billionaire, got divorced, has divorced his wife for 25 years, married a younger woman, and guess what did she do? She got pregnant and had children. And this woman was 46. She was 46. That tells me they spent some money to make sure she had kids. Because Bill, Bill's worth like 3.1 billion. And, you know, people are talking about the divorce and the big payout. Here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. When you have billions and you go through a divorce settlement, you know what the only thing that changes your life is you no longer have someone that you wake up next to. Your money doesn't change, your ability to do things, your ability to travel, it doesn't change. Bill, Jeff Bezos got divorced, I think it cost him like 17 billion. He didn't even miss the money. <laughs> he didn't even miss the money. But if these guys who are broke and struggling and they're living in the broken village with a broken mindset and a broken heart and a broken spirit. All they can see is that's too much. They don't want to step up and be men. They don't want to step up and be providers. They don't want to step up and be protectors. The, the village is broken on both sides because you've got men who don't know their role and you've got women who don't know their role. They don't understand their roles. They don't know their roles. They don't know their roles. 
And with this creates this harmony because I go back to my friend who got the vasectomy and once he got exposed to the concept of family, it turned his heart. It triggered something in him. This man went ahead and had his vasectomy reversed and got his girlfriend intentionally pregnant. He did that shit on purpose. He was hoping she would get pregnant. She was hoping he did that because he got exposed. And like I said, like, you know, uh, I'm not making any more Kevin Samuels videos because that whole high value man conversation is a facade. Most men will never be high value. Most women will never have a high value man. And incidentally, most high value men have no game because they spend all their time developing their career or their business. So I think it's a it's a really interesting conversation. Kevin has built himself quite the business on a concept that is deeply flawed. And you want to know why it works? The village is broken. Instead of being a good man like your grandfather, your grandfather, he worked at the, the plant and he, he took his little lunch pail to the plant and he came home to your grandmother and he made sweet love to your grandmother. And your grandmother had your mom and dad and they raised them in this tiny little house and your grandmother respected your grandfather even though he wasn't rich. He was a good, solid man. And then your, your mother grew up respecting her father. Then she went out and found a man that she could respect and boom, they had you. They had you. These people who weren't rich, who were not um, well known, they had you. But now here you are in this social media world with a broken village where you don't understand how to have community. You don't understand how to have a relationship. You don't understand how to be in a relationship. You don't understand your role in the relationship. And you don't understand because like, once again, going back to disruptive mail and why I cut down the channel because I built it wrong. Like all of the kinky, freaky, sexy stuff was the lure, but I neglected to tell men how I got there. My life wasn't always like that. When I was married, I didn't cheat on my wife. Didn't do it. So how did I go from being a married man to being this sexual adventurous person and having all of these experiences? Because I was raised right. I remember years ago, I put this comment on Facebook. I was raised right, but sometimes I like acting a fool. I have enough knowledge to know the difference when I'm doing something wrong. I actually know when I'm doing something wrong. It's not like, oh, this was a mistake. No, I was like, I'm doing something wrong. Like speeding. When I speed, like I had my Porsche up to 155 at two o'clock in the morning. That was wrong. I knew it. I was fully 100% aware of it. And I was zoom, 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 zoom. Hearing that engine hum. I was fully aware that it was wrong. In the broken village, people are doing things and they have no concept that it is wrong. Take these people who would rent my cars, keep my cars, ignore my messages, not pay me, and end up getting arrested. You know, so many of them were surprised when they got arrested because they, they were like, I just kept this car and I wasn't paying for it. No big deal. See, people don't have an understanding. And going back to your grandfather and your father's, there was right and there was wrong. There was no gray area. It was either was right or it was wrong. No gray area. Today, everything's gray. Everything's a little gray. Everything is opaque. There is no right or wrong. Because when I come on here and I say, my men, you need to be leaders. You need to be providers. You need to be protectors. You need to be the man of the house. Once again, when I say that you need to be a provider, a protector, you're emotionally, you are a boy. You might be 35, 40, 50 years old, 
but emotional, from an emotional standpoint, from a maturity standpoint, you are an adolescent because you absolutely assiduously refute responsibility. Your grandfather was responsible. Your father was responsible. You, not so much. You avoid responsibility, and this bleeds into the content over at Hustlers Kung Fu. Having a business means that you will be responsible. It means you will be the owner and the manager of a lot of things. And essentially, we live in a broken village where people don't want to be responsible. People don't want to be accountable. People don't want to be the man or the woman. Being the man. Like, I remember one time <clears throat> when I was married, we were having a hard time. And my wife came to me and was like, I need X, Y, and Z. And I had to work ridiculous amount of overtime to make that happen. But I made it happen because I was the man of the house. When your wife comes to you and says, I need, not I want, but I need, as the man of the house, it is your duty, it's your obligation to fulfill that need because this woman is your wife. And most men of today want nothing to do with that. Nothing. I don't want to be held responsible for another human being. And this is why people do Forex and day trading and Bitcoin, because this is a way that if all the stars align in the specific order, you can get rich without responsibility. And that's the antithesis of many of the things that I teach that to get rich, you need to be very responsible. I got a 10 year plan. I got, I'm getting ready to overhaul everything and move into these next 10 years where I'm gonna be extremely responsible I want to be extremely accountable and probably in the next two years, I'll be married. And I like people like, Glendon, Glendon, don't do it, man. Don't do it. See, I have lived the free agent lifestyle. And here's something that if you are honest with yourself in your, when you're 20, who you were when you're 25, if you're that same person when you're 50, you have failed at life. I am no longer the dude that was fucking this dude's wife upstairs while her husband was downstairs washing the dishes. I'm not that dude anymore. I would never do that. I would never, cause like, you know, I noticed when I got this money and this is one of the reasons that there's been a big shift. Um, when I became more responsible, I had more responsibilities and I got this money, my freaky behavior w changed dramatically. And there was someone who used to be my submissive and we were talking about this the other day and as she gained monetary success, she's still submissive, but she does, she's like, I can live without all that stuff now because she's replaced that with her business and her other interests. And one of the things that has happened to me is I have replaced, you know, being successful, making money, building businesses, helping people. It's just more important than fucking a lot of chicks. Now I will say fucking a lot of chicks can be a lot of fun. I am not going to be dismissive. I am not going to turn my back on my past because it is my past. It is who it is the stuff that made me who I am today. And Looking back in all those experiences, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. And if I had to do my life over again, I wouldn't change a thing. Wouldn't change a thing because I've got some great friends from my kinky experiences. I know not one, not two, not three. I know three, three, three female millionaires because of those experiences that we're still friends to this day. I wouldn't have had those experiences if I haven't entered into those type of arrangements, so to speak, or adventures. And one of the things that, 
you know, I'm understanding as I create content for the Institute of Economic Thought, which is about the broader economy, not about business. I have the corporate game, that's business channel. I have Hustlers Kung Fu, business channel. This is about conversations about the economy, conversations about the global reset, conversations about what is happening. And one of the things that I want to do is I understand as a social media influencer, I have a fiduciary duty to you guys to tell you the truth. Now, there's a road wearing little bitch who will lie to you all day long and talks about honor and all this other stuff, but he'd be lying his ass off. One of the things that I have understood in what, take the car rental business. Uh, the car rental business failed because I did not have enough of the correct data when I needed it. If I had the correct data at the onset of that business, I never would have started that business. I never would have, never would have even thought about starting that business. So one of the things that you've got to understand with the Institute of Economic Thought, I'm giving you the real. And part of the corporate citizens, like, you know, and someone like, you're putting out incorrect information that people, like, here's the thing, if you die without a will, you're, you're, if you have sizable assets, they will go through probate. And you think they're gonna look like, right now, go, go ahead and do a Google search, how much money are cities holding on to of people that die? It's billions of dollars. So you think that they're going to work really hard to find your relatives and friends and your family? You think? No, Google it. These cities are holding billions of dollars of people who died without a will and it went to the state. And after a certain point of time, they get to keep that money. This is why they're in no hurry to find your family. This is why if a person of means and assets, you need to have a will. You need to have a directive so after you pass, your wishes will happen because you left instructions, you left written instructions. So don't be coming on here talking about, you know, many of you are lazy. And I'm gonna say that with the most love I can muster. You don't wanna do things the right way and then when bad things happen because you didn't do the right things, you're surprised and you want someone to help you out your jam. One of the worst things you can do, because someone asked me, why did I have life insurance? Life insurance is a direct payment to my beneficiaries. You know, I have people asking me like, you know, why don't you own the house? I don't want to own the house. If I wanted to own the house, I would own the house. One of the reasons I don't want to own the house is the next house I have is going to be our house. Because once again, I understand me. I understand that the path that I was going on was if I don't get off this path, I'm going to be an old man and be alone. That was a realization that came to me about two years ago. And I started to facilitate and make changes in myself. And I started to work on myself. And I started to do things that I needed to do to create a better me. Because here's the thing. When you work on yourself and you can look in the mirror and say, I am messed up and I need to make changes. That is such a powerful position to be in because you're taking accountability. You're taking ownership of who you are. And when you take ownership, this is the pathway to greatness. This is the pathway to becoming a remarkable human being. But the village is broken. Everyone is trying to follow the next dysfunctional broken person. It's, you know, Earl Nightingale talked about this, follow the follower. It's gotten worse. You've got broken people following broken people and yielding a more broken situation. Because anytime someone comes on here, like uh, I'll mention something. Like I did a video on Savage Finance uh, talking about Richard Fain and his finance and cars. Because here's the thing, for the average person, financing a car is a bad deal. Leasing a car is a bad deal. And recently, Richard comes up, why should you? And I was like, that was the whole point I was trying to make, Richard. And he comes up with a video why you shouldn't finance cars. 
because I feel that Richard is now starting to understand his audience better. And like it, I can go out and finance a Bentley or something and have a ridiculous thirty five hundred dollar a month payment. I can do that. You want to know why I can do that? Because I have multiple revenue streams. So it, it's like me doing it and then putting it up here like, hey, that's the thing to do is fiduciary wrong because I can do it because I have multiple income streams. You can't do it if you just have a regular job and a limited income. And this is something else. I have the ability to tremendously scale my income. Like I can drop a new training platform. I can drop a new course and I can make millions really quickly. In three to six months, I can make millions. So my financial situation is so dissimilar from yours. It is irresponsible for me to talk about that. I can do this as if you can mirror it. Cause like, once again, you can't do this because you don't have the foundational aspect that I do. And I'm not going to lie to you and whisper in your ears and gas you up and get you thinking you could do all this stuff when the reality is no, you can't. You simply can't because you're not where I am. And that's really a distinct and poignant thing to note. And that's why I speak to you guys the way that I do, because I understand that most of you are not where I'm at. You can't do the things I do. Not now, maybe in the future, but not now you can't do it. So once again, the village is broken and the village is going to stay broken because right now I am not the only one talking about an impending recession. People in the stock market, investors, billionaires, everyone's like, hey, we're heading to a recession. Everyone who understands money and understands the economy, we're all coming to the same conclusion. We're going to have a recession and it's going to be quite nasty. It's going to be quite nasty. And once again, the Fed has to raise interest rates, which is going to if they raise interest rates, let's say seven times, that's going to destroy the mortgage market. That's going to destroy the housing market. Because every time the interest rates go up a few points, X amount of people fall below the line. Folks who will have qualified at this lower interest rate will not qualify at this higher interest rate. And the more they raise the interest rate, and that's going to be a tricky proposition for them to raise the interest rate because if they go too fast, they could cause more damage than good. So once again, we got a lot, a lot of things going on, but the village is broken, man. The village is broken. We got men and women out here. We got men and women out here who rather have a kid out of wedlock than to get married and have a kid. And then complain about being on child support. That makes no sense to me. No sense to me whatsoever that you would rather have a kid with a person that you're not madly, deeply, passionately in love with. Like my friend with a vasectomy. He told me he actually cried when she broke down and she got her knees and she cried and she tears streaming down her face. She's like, she broke me down, man. Cause he's like, I knew she loved me enough to be with me. Even though I knew that she wanted to have children, she would love me enough to be with me, even though she knew I had a vasectomy. And when she heard my plan and when I told her, it's like, I want you to be the mother of my children. It just broke her down. She was so overwhelmed with all of the love and the joy that this man that she was in love with made this move to make fulfill her wishes and to fulfill his latent wishes. Because see, like, let, let me go ahead and spill some beans here. One of the reasons that the village is broken is people are living in fear. People are living in fear. They don't want to get married. They don't want to have children. They don't want to build families and they want to live in a van because it's easier. It's easier because the village is broken and the elders of yesteryear are gone. My aunt Bunny, who recently passed at 101, essentially, this is what we're dealing with. The elders, the people who held together, the big mamas, they're gone. And all we have are these social media charlatans teaching people broken ways, broken ways. Like when I was out being sexually adventurous, I never lied to these chicks 
about my intentions. Now, I, I will admit that I never, a lot of chicks never knew my name. They never knew my name. You want to know why they, knew my, they didn't know my name? Google. If they knew my name and they went to Google, they would see all this stuff. So I actually gave them my stage name. Gave them a stage name, my club name. And that was the only lie that I told them. I did not tell women I loved them when I didn't. I did not bring that up. But the village is broken and the village is gonna stay broken. And I feel that we're going to have a social renaissance in the next 10 years because of where we're heading. And believe it or not, you're not going to be the people who are going to lead us out of darkness. It's going to be the rich people. You want to know why? Because they have the money and they have the resources. They're operating from a resource rich environment. And this is where the change is going to, because you can already see it. You can already see it. What you're going to have is this Google engineer who had to live in California. Now he lives in Des Moines, Iowa. They're going to change the neighborhood. They're going to change everything. So let me know your thoughts and opinions of this. I know I went a little long. I went a little while, but let me know. So I will see you guys in the next one.